The courts weigh in. Justices and judges on religion and the public square. Just this week, from charter schools to abortion limits, to ballot initiatives, to immigration, we have the details. How will religion impact the upcoming presidential election? We're joined by two leading scholars at the intersection of faith and politics. What was it like? <laughs> what was it like? Jordan asked me if I felt like I was at home. I said, yeah, I feel like I'm at home. A joyous Catholic conversion during the Easter Vigil Mass. Tammy Peterson's very personal homecoming. And faith along the free throw line as Christianity mixes with March Madness. EWTN News In Depth starts now. I think the central issue in the case really is whether a charter school is a, a government public state actor or whether they're a, um, a private actor um, contracting with the state to provide a service. The future of a first of its kind Catholic charter school rests in the hands of the Oklahoma State Supreme Court. It's just one of a long line of court cases which illustrate how religion cases or First Amendment judicial decisions impact society and daily life in America. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. We look at a series of those cases in today's program. We begin in Oklahoma, where a virtual school is fighting for its right to provide a state-funded Catholic education to hundreds of students across the state. We have vast swaths of, of uh, rural communities and smaller communities where brick and, traditional brick and mortar Catholic schools are unavailable, just financially not feasible. In many of the rural areas of Oklahoma, a traditional Catholic school might be hard to come by. It's these rural communities where St. Isidore of Seville Catholic Virtual School hopes to connect students with a Catholic education. Named after the patron of the internet, St. Isidore is an online institution that aims to provide a high quality, faith-based education to students throughout Oklahoma. We have parents who have applied to the school for their children who really want Catholic education but live in an area of the state where it's not financially feasible. This unique Catholic school is at the center of an Oklahoma lawsuit that could make its way to the U.S. Supreme Court and even broadly shape freedom of religion and school choice across the country. St. Isidore is the first religious charter school in America and its tuition will come at no cost to students. Michael Scaperlanda, Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City and a professor of law emeritus, says that unlike a private Catholic school, where parents can use tax credits and vouchers for tuition, St. Isidore will receive public funding from the state. Parents receive the tax credits or the vouchers and then they apply that to whatever school they want. Um, really our charter school operates basically the same way except the money flows directly to the charter school but it's still based upon parent choice. St. Isidore will provide a private school education at a public school price. Bishop David Kondurla of the Diocese of Tulsa stressed the school's Catholic identity in a letter saying it's fully Catholic in its curriculum and mission and gives all students an opportunity to be formed in what is true, good, and beautiful. The school plans to open for the 2024-25 school year, but its future remains uncertain due to its ongoing legal battle. State Attorney General Gettner Drummond is suing the Oklahoma Statewide Virtual Charter School Board for its approval of St. Isidore. Here we have a public entity that is fully funded and controlled by the state. It eviscerates the, the separation of church and state. It combines them. He told the Oklahoma Supreme Court on Tuesday that the school violates the Oklahoma Constitution and would be a state endorsement of Catholicism. This case is not about exclusion of a religious entity from government aid, which would implicate the free exercise of religion. Rather, it is about the state creation of a religious school which unequivocally establishes religion. Do we want the state of Oklahoma telling people how to worship? I don't think we do. And if we ordain this church, if this stands, then this court has effectively authorized 
a state religion. Philip Seckler, an attorney with Alliance Defending Freedom, who represented the Oklahoma statewide virtual charter school board, said that St. Isidore's does not violate the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits the government from establishing a religion. St. Isidore poses no Establishment Clause problem for three reasons I would like to focus on today. First, St. Isidore is privately owned and operated. It's not a government entity. Second, St. Isidore's conduct cannot be fairly attributed to the state under the state action doctrine. And third, the term public school doesn't make St. Isidore a state actor. Indeed, the act adds the phrase established by contract to distinguish charter schools from a traditional school established by the government. If the court rules in the virtual charter school board's favor, St. Isidore will begin to receive state funding in July. Many see the lawsuit as a test case, but St. Isidore's team say that they just want all the students in Oklahoma to have access to a Catholic education. We do not want to be a test case. Um, so, so the reason why Oklahoma is because Archbishop Coakley and Bishop Condrela had a vision of providing Catholic schools throughout the state in an innovative way. For more insight into this case and its impact on the school choice debate, we're joined by Nicole Garnett. She's a professor at the University of Notre Dame Law School and an expert in education policy. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks for joining us. Various points were raised in oral argument. The separation of church and state, comparisons to other types of groups and service providers like, um, like hospitals, Catholic hospitals that do receive government funding. What stood out to you? Well, I think that the most the thing that stood out most to me is the the basic argument that was made that St. Isidore, the school, is a is a private religious organization. And if St. Isidore was a private organization that wasn't religious, there would be no question that St. Isidore could be a charter school. So they have Native American charter schools in Oklahoma. They have STEM charter schools in Oklahoma and classical charter schools. The one thing you can't be is a religious charter school. And I think that the analogy to the hospital is really good because as, as the advocates pointed out and the justices as well, the, you know, the state of Oklahoma gives money to all kinds of religious institutions, including religious private schools. It just has this one hit prohibition on um, the charter school program. It says we'll contract with all kinds of different um, entities, 32 of them in fact, 32 private entities run charter schools in Oklahoma, but we just are gonna have a hard and fast rule that discriminates against religion. And I think it became quite clear in the oral argument um, that that's just inconsistent with the First Amendment's prohibition on religious discrimination. Well, explain that to us a little bit more because we hear that argument thrown out all the time, the separation of church and state, and it's this magical wand that is pulled out any time that a religious entity wants to partner with the government. So explain that to us a little bit. Sure. So there is a, a misunderstanding, a misapprehension, a dated understanding of what, what's called the separation of church and state, um, which is that the, the Constitution, whether it's the Oklahoma Constitution or the federal Constitution's uh, Establishment Clause, prohibits the government from cooperating with religious organizations to advance the common good, when in fact, the opposite is true. The First Amendment to the, First Amendment to the um, Free Exercise Clause requires the government to extend an invitation to religious organizations to participate fully in public programs when it extends that invitation to secular organizations. I think one thing that struck me about, particularly the attorney general's arguments in this case, um, was that he seems to be sort of stuck in what the Beckett Fund has called a shag carpet understanding of the Establishment Clause, one that's stuck in the 1970s and hasn't been updated since. He was making arguments that just are so dated and so inconsistent with what we now understand to be free exercise of religion. And that includes the full participation in public life uh, of people of faith and religious institutions. And that's all St. Isidore is asking. St. Isidore is not asking for any special benefit. All it's asking is to have the same right to educate kids, especially poor kids and kids in religious in, in, um, in rural areas of a big rural state that, the, that a private entity that isn't religious right. is, it's, it's would be access. entitled to. 
access to a religious education. Well, the Supreme Court, as you said, that 1970s old understanding, the Supreme Court has made significant moves, significant progress in the last decade to protect religious schools from discrimination. The last ruling in 2022 in the Carson case out of Maine uh, made a lot of changes too. How do those changes make the interpretation of the law here a little different? So uh, Carson is a really, really important case. So Carson versus Macon held that the state of Maine violated the free exercise clause by excluding religious schools from a, a tuition support program for kids in schools without uh, high, uh, districts without high schools. And the court said, look, that's just religious discrimination. It's odious to our, con our constitution. And it, it actually went farther and it said the state of Maine can't use the state of Maine would say, well, we're it's fine to if it's a religious school as long as it's not teaching religion. And as we know as Catholics, there is that's a distinction without a difference. Mm -hmm. To be a religious school is to teach religion, to infuse the curriculum with religion. And the Supreme Court said exactly that. You cannot exclude a religious school from a public program, a school choice program, either because it is has of its religious character or the fact that its curriculum is religious. And that's what the state of Oklahoma is doing with its charter school program. This is a school choice program. It's a privately operated school and no child will go to St. Isidore unless the parent chooses to send that kid to St. Isidore. So public funds only flow to St. Isidore as a result of private choice. And in that context, Carson makes abundantly clear that the free exercise of religion requires the state to include religious schools in its publicly funded school program of school choice. Now, Nicole, quickly, there is also another argument where people fear government funds. They fear the strings like of including pronouns, including any new transgender regulations because they receive government funding and having that affect their schools. What do you say to that? So I think obviously it's a legitimate concern. I've been an advocate for parental choice my whole life. And I'm, I'm grateful to God that so many states are now embracing uh, parental choice, private school choice programs, as well as charter schools. Um, but you know, as Catholics, we have to know where to draw the line and sometimes deals will not be just. And that point we have to say, well, we're just not going to participate in this public program or turn it again and say, this is unconstitutional. Um, you know, and in the case of St. Isidore, there are some regulations, um, but the fact is that they're actually relatively free curricularly to shape their own curriculum. Um, and I think that's the case in most uh, school choice programs. Um, the only thing I would say is, you know, one of the problems is, you know, they the government can regulate private schools, religious schools, because they um, receive public funds, but it can regulate private schools, religious schools, religious institutions, even if they don't. Um, so the battle is primarily to, to uh, enact just laws, because as we know in the public's, in, in the government often imposes regulations on entities, think of Hobby Lobby, for example, you know, um, that was required to provide contraception. Supreme Court said that was illegal and constitutional. Um, that Hobby Lobby doesn't get public funds. So the risk of regulatory incursions are real, and we have to be willing to fight for our religious liberty. Um, but they're present, they're ever present, and not just in the school choice context. Right. Well, it's something to look out for. Nicole, thank you for your analysis, and we will come back to you when the court takes us up with a decision. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Twin rulings out of Florida's top court this week. The Sunshine State Supreme Court upheld the state's 15-week abortion limit, while also paving the way for a ballot initiative on abortion in the fall. Pro-abortion challengers filed a lawsuit against the 15-week limit shortly after Governor Ron DeSantis signed it into law in 2022. In a 6-to-1 vote, the Florida Supreme Court ruled the law could remain in effect. Its decision triggers the state's Heartbeat Protection Act, a six-week ban that will take effect next month. But voters will have an opportunity to override these abortion laws in the fall when they take to the polls. The high court also approved a ballot initiative that could enshrine abortion access in the state constitution. Pro-abortion activists celebrated the ballot edition, but pro-life advocates believe the amendment goes too far. We're not saying that anybody has to ideologically align with abortion. We're saying that politicians shouldn't be the determiners of that decision. This amendment goes far, far beyond where most Floridians would land on the issue and is extreme in its, in its scope. 
Prior to these laws taking effect, Florida served as an abortion hotspot for women in other southern, in other southern states with stricter bans. Citizens will vote on the ballot amendment when they go to the polls on November 5th. The amendment needs at least 60 percent of the vote to be approved. This just a week after the Supreme Court of the United States heard arguments regarding the safety of the abortion pill mifepristone. The justices heard from pro-life doctors who believe the FDA should reinstate what they are saying are necessary safeguards for the pill. The court seemed skeptical of the doctor's legal standing in the case, in large part because none of them had ever prescribed mifepristone in their medical practice. They object to potentially being placed in a position where they might have to treat patients experiencing side effects of the abortion pill regimen, including incomplete abortions and life-threatening bleeding. Justices questioned why the doctors needed to take this broad course of action when they had the freedom to exercise religious and conscientious objections. A decision is expected by the end of June. The U.S. Supreme Court is not done yet with the life issue. In just a few weeks, it will hear another case about abortion, this time regarding Idaho's abortion ban. In Idaho versus the United States, the Biden administration is challenging Idaho's 2022 abortion law, which completely bans the procedure except to save the life of the mother. The government says the ban conflicts with the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, or EMTALA, which requires physicians to provide necessary stabilizing treatment to a person experiencing a medical emergency, including abortion. Idaho maintains that its ban does not conflict with Amtala because it does not mention abortion. Oral argument will take place on April 24th. And an important hearing this week at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals about the controversial Texas immigration law, SB4. Passed by the Texas legislature, it makes entering Texas illegally a state crime and allows state law enforcement officers to arrest and deport suspects, potentially upending the federal government's long-held authority over immigration matters. The Biden administration argues SB4 is unconstitutional, would cause chaos as it oversteps the U.S. Border Patrol and would harm U.S. relationship with Mexico. At the Fifth Circuit this week, the Texas Solicitor General told the justices that Texas law, quote, maybe went too far, but actually complemented federal law and was enforceable. After the hearing, the appeals court allowed a hold on the state law to remain in place while constitutional challenges continue through the court system. We're just getting started on this edition of EWTN News In Depth. There's much more ahead, including a conversion to Catholicism that we've been accompanying for some time. If I have a prayer with someone, I can feel, I can feel God in me when I pray with someone. The Road of Life brings Tammy Peterson to Catholicism. We follow her journey as she opens her heart and her soul to the church. I pray that we do win, but um, again, I know that um, I'm sure God, if he's you know up there working hard, he's got some, some bigger things in mind than, uh, than our basketball team. And faith at the final four, a Christian take on March Madness coming up. EWTN News In Depth is coming right back. Earlier this year, EWTN News In Depth brought you the story of Tammy Peterson, diagnosed with an uncurable cancer and given just months to live. Against all odds, through the power of praying the rosary, Tammy, who was not Catholic, was miraculously healed to the surprise of her doctors. That journey brought her to Catholicism and the decision to convert. Tammy's story all the more compelling because her husband, Jordan Peterson, is a world-renowned psychologist and religious skeptic. But he was by her side last weekend as she joined the Catholic Church. Reporter Colin Flynn was there. <laughs> In the city of Toronto, the capital of Canada, in St. Peter's Parish Church, they're celebrating Good Friday. And among the congregation is Tammy Peterson, who is on the eve of her confirmation. It's been a moment, Tammy says, she's been building up to for five years. And after the service, 
we sit outside. We're sitting here at St. Peter's Parish in Toronto and tomorrow you're being confirmed. I am. How are you feeling? I feel good. I feel, I don't know what's going to happen exactly, but I'm more emotional than I was. I went to, uh, did my first confession and uh, brought up some things that are recent that I was concerned about and a couple of things that have, oh, from my like teen years and I burst into tears. Oh. I burst into tears. More in, I think, gratitude and uh, gratitude, that kind of tears. Did A you? gratitude that I didn't understand before. Mm. And I've learned over the years of the years of not going to church because I didn't like the priest or I didn't like the location of the church or I, I didn't like the time of the service or whatever it was that would stop me from going. That 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 those are excuses that have nothing to do with the reason to go there. I'm there with the with God and I need to be, I just need to be present and show up, get down on my knees and say, I'm here. Any doubts, Tommy? No. No doubts? No, none. No second thoughts? No second thoughts. This isn't like marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not thinking, oh, am I doing the right thing? Is this really for me or? No, I'm not thinking that. I think that's not up to me to decide. The following day, people in Toronto are starting to celebrate the Easter weekend. But that morning, Tammy is at Holy Rosary Parish in Forest Hill, where she and around a dozen other converts are preparing for tonight's Easter vigil, when they will become Catholics. The bells will be ringing, and then there'll be the, the Gloria will be sung. So at that point, you'll be standing for that. And by her side is her sponsor, Queenie Yu, the woman who introduced Tammy to the faith after she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I went to visit her with a rosary that had been blessed by Pope Francis, an image of Our Lady and the baby Jesus. Uh, I was just going to say hello. I didn't expect to later on come back and teach her how to pray the rosary and pray it with her for five weeks. I started seeing a bond develop between her and Our Lady between both mothers. And then we're gonna, we pray in silence. And she mentioned God. that her illness was a gift because through her illness, she found God and she couldn't have found him in any other way. Only God could write poetry with the events in our life. And then we'll go out into the world and bring the light of Christ uh, to those who do not yet know him. Very exciting. And Tammy, you said that you were feeling more emotional than yeah. you were before, maybe than you thought you would be. Yeah. Why is that, do you think? I think that God's been whispering at me for a very long time to come His way. And it's taken me a long time to get this far. And so I think I'm, I think it's relief, maybe, to be here. Yeah, I think it's probably relief. It feels right. Yeah, it feels right. And at 8 p.m. in the dark, the Easter Vigil begins, led by Father Peter Tyrone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, on this most sacred night in which our Lord Jesus Christ passed over from death to life, the Church calls upon her sons and daughters scattered throughout the world to come together to watch and pray. If we keep the memorial of the Lord's Paschal Solemnity in this way, listening to His Word and celebrating His mysteries, then we shall have the sure hope of sharing His triumph over death and living with Him in God. On one side of Tammy stands her sponsor, Queenie, and on the other side, her husband, Jordan Peterson, who says he has seen how her renewed faith has changed her life. I love my wife from the moment I laid eyes on her when I was a kid. And if you love someone, it hurts you when you see them deviate from the thing that draws you to them. And since she's pursued her efforts at enlightening herself more thoroughly, and this investigation of Catholicism has been key to that, She's much more who she is. And so it's great. It's great. It's ridiculously good. 
The best love story is the love story between a soul and God. And that's what we see tonight at her confirmation. It really can be eternal. Tammy Mary, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. And the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. You've just been confirmed. I have. How are you feeling? Jordan asked me if I felt like I was at home. I said, yeah, I feel like I'm at home. In Toronto, Canada, Colm Flynn, EWTN News In Depth. Our prayers and heartfelt congratulations to Tammy Peterson on her joyous homecoming. We know she's one of thousands of people around the globe who opened their hearts to the Lord this Easter weekend. Her proud husband, Jordan, had much more to say in our conversation with him, including a straight answer to our straight question about his potential future with Catholicism. We'll have that in a few minutes, but first, we take a break for some important news headlines in the Week in Review. The fallout and the consequences continue for Israel after airstrikes kill World Central Kitchen workers helping to feed starving Palestinian civilians. Israeli families protest to demand progress in releasing their loved ones from Hamas captivity. And a cardinal calls one candidate a cafeteria Catholic, as the other candidate is criticized for selling Bibles. How important a role will religion play in this year's presidential election? Our expert panel, ahead. Israel is calling an airstrike on aid workers in Gaza a grave mistake carried out in serious violation of Israeli military procedures. That internal military investigation, released on Friday, tops the Week in Review. Seven World Central Kitchen employees were killed when their convoy was struck in a targeted attack by the Israeli military, despite the fact that their vehicles were marked and they had coordinated their movements with the Israeli army. The attack on the aid workers from the highly respected World Central Kitchen has prompted condemnation from around the globe and put the government of Benjamin Netanyahu on the defensive. In its report, the Israeli military says its soldiers mistakenly identified the vehicles as carrying Hamas operatives and that those involved were not aware of the aid convoy's coordination plan. Two senior Israeli officers have been fired. World Central Kitchen founder Jose Andres said the report did not go far enough and called on an independent commission to investigate the killings of his colleagues. The group's operations in Gaza have been suspended. After the deadly attack, a freighter and two small ships carrying hundreds of tons of aid from Cyprus to the Gaza Strip turned around and headed back to Cyprus. The shipment, which had been coordinated with World Central Kitchen, included rice, flour, pasta, proteins, canned vegetables and dates traditionally used to break the daily Ramadan fast. It was enough to prepare more than one million meals for a Palestinian population on the brink of starvation. Here's the former CEO of World Central Kitchen, who is still close to the staff and mission. The UN has reported that famine is happening in Gaza. And so we've seen the boats got turned around. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's clearly a situation that is getting worse, not better. Access is extraordinarily limited. We've heard how so few trucks, aid, aid organizations are get, able to get in so few trucks, which is why World Central Kitchen was looking, was trying everything it could and, and was using this boat route. And so, you know, all of this just seems so unnecessarily tragic right now. And I think that's what's so heartbreaking about all of this is, you know, World Central Kitchen team was simply trying to help. President Biden said he was outraged about the deaths of the seven food aid workers. In a phone call on Thursday with Prime Minister Netanyahu, he warned that future U.S. support for the Gaza war depends on specific, concrete and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering and the safety of aid workers. 
The tragic World Central Kitchen deaths happened during yet another week of heightened tensions in Israel. These visuals from the Israeli Knesset where frustrated and grieving family members of those still held hostage after the Hamas attack on October 7th demanded action to free their loved ones. It has been six months since their captivity and critics say more than 100 hostages have been abandoned as negotiations for a ceasefire and their release have consistently broken down. An astounding admission by French President Emmanuel Macron pegged to the 30th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda. Macron says France and its allies could have stopped the 1994 genocide that left more than 800,000 people dead, mainly ethnic Tutsis and moderate Hutus, who tried to protect them. In a social media video scheduled for release on Sunday, Macron said France and its Western and African allies lacked the will to stop the mass killings, despite the historical experience of witnessing the Holocaust during World War II. France was a main enabler of the Hutu government in Rwanda, under which the killings occurred. An important call this week between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. It was their first exchange since their summit last November in California, which we show here, and marked what the White House called the importance of two powers maintaining an open dialogue. The call was described as a candid and constructive opportunity to touch base. The goal? To avoid surprises and any confrontations. The two discussed Taiwan independence, China's military operations in the South China Seas, artificial intelligence, and human rights concerns in China. President Biden and his Catholic faith life came under scrutiny last weekend in a conversation on national television with the president's bishop, Wilton Cardinal Gregory of Washington, D.C. In a discussion on Easter Sunday about faith in America on CBS's Face the Nation, Cardinal Gregory said he believed the president's faith is, quote, very sincere. But like a number of Catholics, Gregory said, referring primarily to life issues, he picks and chooses dimensions of the faith to highlight, while ignoring or even contradicting other parts. There's a phrase that we have used in the past, a cafeteria Catholic. You choose that which is attractive and dismiss that which is challenging. While acknowledging the president's devoted Catholic Church attendance, the cardinal expressed his wish that President Biden not sidestep what he called hot buttons, like the Catholic Church's teaching on life and biological sex. As the intersection of faith and politics looms large for President Biden, recent attention and some degree of criticism is also focused on former President Donald Trump, who has urged people to buy a commemorative $60 Bible. Mr. Trump is licensing the use of his name for the God Bless the USA Bible, which fuses Christianity and patriotism by including a copy of the U.S. Constitution, the Pledge of Allegiance, and Declaration of Independence alongside the scriptures. By mixing the message critics say religion and patriotism, good by themselves, are being blended and used as a political tool. As this year's election comes into focus, what role will religion play in presidential politics and other races around the country? To discuss, we're joined by two leading Catholic voices. Fran Meyer is a senior fellow in the Catholic Studies program at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. His work focuses on the intersection of Christian faith, culture, and public life. His most recent book, released earlier this year, is True Confessions, Voices of Faith from a Life in the Church. And Kenneth Craycraft is a professor of moral theology at Mount St. Mary's Seminary and School of Theology in Cincinnati, Ohio. His expertise is the intersection of politics and religion. His newly released book is Citizens Yet Strangers, Living Authentically Catholic in a Divided America. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you both for joining us for this important conversation. Fran, let's start with you. You've navigated political moments from within the chancery as the right hand to Archbishop Shapu for years, a Catholic leader who has never shied away from political engagement. How should Catholics frame their engagement in politics? Well, I think every Catholic has an obligation to consult his or her conscience and follow what the conscience uh, tells that person to do. But the point uh, where we where people get confused is is that the conscience is in some sort of free floating opinion machine. It has to be formed properly in the Christian faith. Once you do that uh, and consult it seriously and try to conform your life to what the church teaches and understand why she teaches what she teaches, 
then you're free to make your decision. And uh, it can be a difficult decision, particularly in a year like this where, you know, uh, in my opinion, both of the candidates are political embarrassments, moral embarrassments. And, uh, and so it's very, very difficult to, to say, hey, you have to vote this way, because people finally have to do the calculus in their own souls. But, but you can't just do that because you have a strong opinion. You have to form your mind and your heart uh, in line with what the church believes about the human person and the human uh, person's dignity. Uh, you know, our first loyalty is to our heavenly citizenship, not to our identity as Americans. We're Catholics first. That has to guide everything that we do. And so, I mean, for example, in our family, um, there's simply no way we're going to vote for President Biden. No way. The reason for that is we have a son with Down syndrome and we have three of our grandchildren who have uh, special needs. And under the regime that's emerging in this country, none of them would have made it because they would have been aborted uh, by most people. Now, whether that translates into voting for another candidate, uh, particularly Trump, that's another matter entirely. Uh, and that's an issue that we just simply haven't thought through and decided yet. But uh, we don't support people who kill unborn children, because that's always grievously wrong. And it's it's astonishing that a, a, a president who takes some pride in uh, his Catholic identity would be so obviously out of sync with what Christians have always believed about the dignity of life. Well, we're going to get into um, a little bit more of President Biden's faith in a second. But Ken, your new book, Citizens Yet Strangers, speaks to this necessary prophetic distance for Catholics with politics. How is that possible then in today's extreme climate with these limited choices that Fran just described? Well, first of all, I like that phrase very much, the prophetic distance. And I, I wish I'd used that in my book because I think it's a, a very well, uh, it's a good way to describe what I tried to do in the book. And, and I completely agree with Fran. The problem is that we oftentimes forget the basic moral language and the moral categories of our Catholic faith. And because we are so sometimes so overdetermined or overdefined in what we think by partisan obligation, and that's a habit that all of us Americans have. And when we, when we Catholics have that habit, it's especially dangerous because what we do is we lose that prophetic distance between faith and politics such that we do one of two things. Either we begin to define our moral lives in terms of our partisan identification and our partisan loyalty, which is bad enough, or worse, we tend to collapse our faith into our political lives and to our uh, partisan identity such that we, we fail to know the difference between the two. And so, and so uh, it's a miracle to behold that the one party or the other happens to hold every single moral position that the Catholic Church holds. Well, of course, that's not true. But the problem is when we collapse that prophetic distance, that's what actually happens. And so we start to think that the Catholic position is the fill in the blank party position, rather than the Catholic tradition have a, having a prophetic distance, as you say, from both parties. And I completely agree with Fran. I don't see any way that uh, I could vote for Joe Biden. I'm not sure that I could vote for Donald Trump either. And and the, the, what we have to understand is that eliminating one because of, say, abortion doesn't necessarily mean that the other one gets our vote by default just because he might espouse politics or policy positions that we call pro-life. We have to take the whole candidate into consideration and all the policies that, that he espouses, and we have to apply the fullness of Catholic faith to that analysis, not just one position. That's right. Well, let's get into those party politics. Fran, in considering the role of Catholic leadership, Cardinal Gregory's recent diagnosis of President Biden as a cafeteria Catholic was welcomed by some and decried by others. How did you receive that comment? Well, candidly, I'm sorry to sound so strong about this, but I mean, I think Biden is, a, is an apostate. I mean, I don't think he's a cafeteria Catholic. I think he, I think he abandoned that that, uh, you know, denomination a long time ago. I mean, a lot of a lot of Catholics, most of us as Catholics are cafeteria based because we choose, you know, we pick and choose what we really want to emphasize in our lives. But I, I think, um, yeah, I think uh, I think the description that um, car the Cardinal used is frankly rather inadequate well, considering 
person. There you go. Well, that's one take. Ken, let's go to you on the language that we use as Catholics being more political than scriptural. You talk about that in your book, and you just mentioned it a few seconds ago. What does that mean then when God and country messages that a candidate is selling, like what pres uh, former President Trump did with his new patriotic Bible? What message does that send? Is there any goodness in that? Is it completely terrible? I think it's completely terrible, and this is why. It, it confuses what it means to be a patriot with what it means to be a Catholic Christian or a Christian in general, and that leads directly to the most grievous uh, offense that we can commit, and that's the, commit, that's the commission of idolatry. There's, yeah. there's, an, there's, not, there's more than a whiff of idolatry in, in, a, in a God bless America Bible, which includes things like the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution or whatever else is in there. And that, that that's not to say that those are bad documents. What, is, what it is to say is that we can't conflate those two things. Because when we do that, it isn't the Catholic faith that emerges as predominant in our minds. It's the patriotism that emerges as predominant in our minds. And we hear a lot about nationalism in this election, and we hear uh, all kinds of different definitions of that. Well, one definition of nationalism is to collapse religious faith into political identity such that the politics be actually becomes an idol. And as I, as I I've said someplace else, I forget where now, it's no less an idolatrous to worship the nation or to collapse our faith into the politics of the nation than it is to bow to a golden calf. And I really worry that we Catholics tend to uh, drift that way. And, and it makes me very nervous when I see Catholics just with uncritically embracing uh, certain political positions that are that are at best in tension with Catholic faith, because that does lead to this, uh, this problem of, of idolatry, where we we worship the flag or we worship the nation, or even if we don't do that overtly, we so collapse the distance to between what it means to be a Catholic Christian and what it means to be an American that, again, we fail to see the difference between the two, and we wind up actually worshiping an idol when we think that we're worshiping God. Well, that's certainly a problem, and Fran, I'll go to you for this. There is a moment in your book where you discuss the inverse, the influence politics has had on the church. Have we reached a point where our church is just too political? Well, I think I, I, I don't know quite how to answer that. I mean, I think uh, I don't think there's such a thing as a Catholic vote anymore. So I'm not sure that even if we wanted to be too political as an institution, we could have any influence. I mean, I think I think there's an I, I really, really like what Ken just said, that kind of idolatrous attitude that most of us have or a lot of us have toward toward our loyalty to the state. Uh, you know, our son was our oldest son went to West Point. And uh, I remember when uh, he was accepted, Sue and I had an enormous amount of pride in that. I, I simply wouldn't encourage anyone to go to the military academies now, uh, because I, I can't imagine why I would support the possibility of my son dying for certain things that uh, I really fundamentally disagree with and, and I find uh, to be immoral. I mean, the country has gone in a very different direction from the kind of nation that I grew up in. And uh, I, I'm much more ambivalent about uh, in endorsing its policies and uh, just kind of an uncritical patriotism. I really, really like the, the, that comment about idolatry because that's a constant temptation. And it has been throughout history. Of you know? course. Uh, uh, so it, it, uh, we're strangers in a strange land. Uh, to, t to borrow from scripture and, and uh, we need to own that and, and behave like it. We need to, we need to support the, the government and support public leadership to the degree that we can, but we have to keep a significant critical distance from it. And that's, by the way, the way Augustine would look at things when he was writing um, 1600 years ago. Well, it's a great example and we're going to leave it right there. Gentlemen, thank you both for your analysis. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Yeah, thanks very much. Some number news to share with you now. Though Easter Day masses are known for their crowds, overall church attendance remains at historic lows in America. A new poll from Gallup breaks down how often people attend a service once a week. 
only 21% of Americans say they attend a religious service every week. More than 30% never attend at all. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormons, topped the list, with 54% of respondents saying they attend church weekly. Almost a third of Protestants say they go to service every week, as well as Muslims. Only 23% of Catholic respondents say they attend a church every week. Pollsters say this drop in church attendance coincides with many Americans' weaker attachment to religion, particularly among young adults, more than a third of whom say they have no religious alignment whatsoever. If you have a child that you love, you want to see them become everything they can be, and that's a lot. There isn't anything better than to see that in someone. When we return, more from Jordan Peterson about his wife's entry into the church. Will he follow? His answer, next. We return now to our conversation with Jordan Peterson, an Eastern interview following his wife's conversion to Catholicism during the Easter Vigil Mass. Will Tammy Peterson's devotion to the faith influence her famous husband to follow in her footsteps? Colin Flynn continues the discussion. Jordan Peterson, it's great to see you again. Thank you for sitting down to do this interview. My pleasure. We're sitting here in Toronto. It is the Easter weekend, which is the most important time for Christians all over the world. When we think of the crucifixion, the resurrection, Jesus taking what was the ancient symbol of torture and of death and turning it into a symbol of, of hope and of new life. What do you think of the Christian Easter message? Oh, so you're going to start with an easy question, are you? Simple. Well, I'll speak psychologically about it I can, and speak in terms of its literary echoes, let's say. It's a variant of the dragon and treasure story, which is the oldest story we have. Um, it's the core story of humanity in some fundamental sense that in the darkest places what's of most value can be found and that's that story reaches its limit in the story of the crucifixion the crucifixion story is a limit story because it describes the encounter a multi-dimensional encounter with the worst that life and death can throw at at us, at, at humanity. The most painful death imaginable, designed as a torture, designed as a torture that was public, that made a particular kind of statement about not misbehaving, let's say. Uh, a, a most unjust death in front of his mother, betrayed by his friends, abandoned by his, clo betrayed by his closest disciple, abandoned by his friends. It's a multi-dimensional tragedy. What the story means, one of the things it means, because it means many things, is that we're called upon, if we want to live the fullest possible life, to confront the limit case of life. And the limit case of life is unjust suffering and malevolence, mm. the, the reality of malevolence. And then the promise in the story is that if that's undertaken wholeheartedly, the consequence is redemptive, transformative and redemptive, a resurrection of the spirit, a resurrection of the spirit eternally. That's the promise. So I know you're not coming at it from a theological point of view, but that, in essence, that idea of from the worst suffering, from the depths of despair, not only can you come out of that, but you can actually, new life can be born out of that strength and hope. Mm -hmm. Fairy tale or reality? Oh no, it's 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 well it's <laughs> why or fairy tale and reality. Right? There's no or there. So the deepest fairy tales are the most real, that's for sure. Yeah, we don't understand fiction. We don't understand what fiction means. Fiction is a form of distillation. And I suppose at times the fictional and the real unite. And that's that's the that's the essence of the Christian claim, I would say. That's the right way of thinking about it. That's a way of thinking about it. There's many ways of thinking about complex things. Your beautiful wife, Tammy. When we last spoke, we talked about her incredible story, 
and her terminal diagnosis, her recovery, miraculous recovery, many say. Um, many people are asking her today how she's feeling as she's confirmed and brought into the Catholic Church. How are you feeling about it? Oh, it's been very good for her. So, Has it been good for you? You mentioned unity. Has it been good for your marriage, for the two of you as a couple? No, it's been great. Why do you say that? So, I loved my wife from the moment I laid eyes on her when I was a kid. And if you love someone, it hurts you when you see them deviate from the thing that draws you to them. And since she's pursued her efforts at enlightening herself more thoroughly, and this investigation of Catholicism has been key to that, she's much more who she is. And that's great, because I love who she is, and so, and so it's great. It's great. It's ridiculously good. But when you so, see how ridiculously good it is, mm-hmm. what is stopping you from embracing the faith of your wife? You mean all those pesky Catholics? <laughs> I don't know if anything is stopping me. What's holding you back? I, I don't think anything's holding me back. Everybody's got their own destiny. And so... Is it in yours? Um, is it in mine? I would say it's unlikely. But why do you say unlikely? I exist on the borders of things. So why is that? I don't know, but that's how it is. So when we interviewed Tammy yesterday and I asked her, how is she feeling the day before being confirmed and brought into the church? She said, very good. I said, any doubts? And she said, no, it's not like marriage. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. After he said such nice things about you, Tommy. Jordan Peterson, thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Good to talk to you. If you would like to hear more of this Jordan Peterson interview, you can watch the full discussion with Colm on the EWTN YouTube channel. As a, a chaplain, if you uh, uh, are there and, and something happens where you, and you say a prayer over them, as soon as you bring in the relationship with God, it just gives peace to everybody. March Madness and the impact of prayer. Godly influence on the basketball court. Up next. If you're a sports fan, chances are your eyes were glued these past few weeks to some terrific college basketball during the NCAA championship games. March is all about March Madness. And if you're paying attention, it doesn't take long to discover some religion mixed in with all those three-pointers. That's what reporter Mark Irons told us when we asked him if he was working or just finding an excuse to watch some basketball at his desk. He shares his observations with us all now. As the teams shoot for a championship, fans are witnessing great performances, and some of the athletes are witnesses to something more. I'm a living testimony. I give all glory to God. I just put the work in, trusted God, and now I'm here. It may not make the headlines, but in men's and women's college basketball, the road to the Final Four has been marked by faith. And players like Paige Beckers for the University of Connecticut are shining a spotlight on it. I just kept on believing. I did all I could so God can do all I can. Opponents are even united in faith. When Beckers was recovering from injury last season, Iowa guard Caitlin Clark, the all-time leading scorer in NCAA Division I college basketball history, said she was praying for Beckers. Clark is Catholic. And before confetti fell on Easter Sunday, Don Staley, the University of South Carolina head coach, posted on X earlier in the day, he is risen. 
Later, after her team advanced to the Final Four, she shared this message. If you don't believe in God, something's wrong with you. Seriously, I'm, I'm a believer. Coach Dan Hurley led the defending champion University of Connecticut men's team to another Final Four this year. Before the start of the 2024 season, he spoke about overcoming challenges. Like I can handle anything that comes with this job, the criticism, uh, the losing, the going through tough stretches. Hurley, a Catholic, says he can handle the job because he relies on a divine person to keep him grounded. My, my foundation starts with my faith, uh, mm. my faith in Jesus Christ. Star guard Mark Sears helped send the University of Alabama men's basketball team to its first Final Four in school history. After victory over Clemson University, he said all the honor and glory you know, goes to God. You know, coming out of high school, you know, wasn't highly recruited. And, you know, my parents, they kept uh, encouraging me to uh, never give up and stay, stay focused, put God first. Putting God first seems to be a priority for Final Four bound North Carolina State forward DJ Burns. Posting thanks God after an earlier win in the NCAA tournament, his profile on X points out what he loves, listing first the Bible, books, and ball. The women's Final Four also includes NC State. Freshman Jana Issa unafraid to express her Muslim faith. She wears a hijab on the court. But faith spills off the court too and into the stands as well. Let's go! Let's go! Purdue University students and basketball superfans Perry and Nick are members of the Paint Crew, the loud, rowdy student section at Purdue home basketball games. It's a great feeling to... Uh have an effect on the game as a fan. To be a student here while this is happening is really cool. They're rooting for Purdue's men's team to win it all this year. And they say their own Catholic faith and fandom aren't mutually exclusive. I've met a lot of really great friends through Paint Crew and invited them to church. I've really started to appreciate the areas that God is working in my life, even if it doesn't necessarily seem super faith-based. Even in defeat, faith still stands strong. Winning and losing are, are part of the sport. Marquette University lost in the Sweet 16 round of the tournament. Father John Lawrence is the men's basketball chaplain at Marquette, a Catholic university. Faith has a place in uh, sports in, at the university. This is integral to uh, how God sees us, and, uh, and this is a a holy thing that we do in a sense. He says the holiness of being human and glorifying God can be on display in a basketball game. It's just a celebration of the nobility of being human. With both suffering and victory, Father Lawrence says what happens within the confines of the court can remind us of Christ, who lived within the boundaries of a fully human life, yet rose with eternal impact. And so I think that uh, the sport is kind of that. You've got these boundaries in sport. You've got to play within the boundaries, right? But you exceed that boundaries in a way. Within the boundaries, if you achieve something that no other team has done, you kind of live forever. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. Thank you, Mark, for those observations. I guess you can watch basketball at your desk again next year, too. And that's a wrap on this edition of EWTN News In-Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Join us again same time next week for more news and reports important to your Catholic life. See you then.